Welcome to another episode of my SME Growth Series, an initiative of Ecobank Nigeria Limited. Today we have Hilda Kabunshega. Hilda is a distinguished executive with over a decade of experience in consulting and human capital development across East and Middle Eastern Africa. Here is to empowering 1 million SMEs in Nigeria. Across Africa, a new era has begun. Shifting our focus to a new horizon, connecting us with the one purpose to create and share opportunities to grow. Today, we are making a brighter tomorrow, built by our dreams and our energy. Across our continent, across the world, we are creating a better way to a better future. A pan-African future, together. Echo Bank, a better way, a better Africa. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for the uh, Ecobank SME Growth Series for putting this together. I'm super excited to speak to you. My name is Hilda Kabushenga. I am the CEO of the African Talent Company, which is a parent company for Jobman Nigeria, um, Nigeria's largest job, job platform. And today we're going to be, I'm going to be sharing a bit about our experience on finding skilled labor in the Japa era and how you go about that. I hope you can all hear me clearly. And, you know, in case I'm moving too fast, hopefully somebody can send a message in the chat so I can slow down, but I think we'll be okay. So I'll just get right into it. So the first thoughts on Japa, you know, I think we all know what it means, so no need to define it, but don't take it personal. You know, it's happened before. I think if you look at the history of Nigeria in the 70s and the 80s, there's always been people migrating for, 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 for better futures. Is this time different? We don't know. Um, we did a poll at Jobberman that revealed that 76% of employers have, have lost employees in their senior and mid-level management. So I think the biggest thing here is that it's impacting a core part of organizations. You're left with a gap that's not very easy to fulfill. Um, and second of all, the same poll showed that, you know, 58% of the professionals who are Japaying are in IT, healthcare, education, predictably, because that's there's easy mobility there. And then there's 23% in the finance and insurance, you know, financial services in industry as well. So a lot of people coming from core industries in society. And what that this doesn't even show is the functions. So it's bread and butter functions, it's accountants, it's HR, it's nurses, it's everyone you work with, especially as a small business, the kind of people you need are the ones who are moving. But the one thing I would say is that you know, the factors driving Japa are beyond a single organization. So don't take it personal. When your employees leave, you shouldn't say it's because of you or something that you did not do right. It's beyond that. I think it's, the, the issues are, are beyond just a singular organization. At the same time, as an organization, I believe we still have a role to play. You know, and not managing talent in the context of the new work reality is definitely is contributing to the Japa trend. With the rise of technology and the internet and young people being able to see what other opportunities are out there for them, Obviously, if they don't feel like they're being managed well in their current organization, they'll look for opportunities, whether it's formal or abroad, and increasingly it's abroad. And this is coming from a place, I think, especially post the pandemic, where people are no longer looking for necessarily you know, physical employment contracts, but it's pretty much like a psychological contract of experience. They want to feel fulfilled in their work. They want to feel like their roles are helping them to thrive beyond just career, but they have work-life balance. They want the flexibility that comes with being able to, you know, to, to, to just live a full life. I think that's slow down in 2020 really stayed with, with people long term. So at the same time, if as an employer, you're not, you know, upgrading or, or, or updating the way you think about managing employees and the way you think about the world of work and their world of work, you'll probably be at a much, much higher risk of losing your staff to the Japa wave because the change is here. And I, I think it's irreversible, especially when you think about millennials and Gen Z. 
And how to even start getting ahead of this, right? I always say, start with understanding the entire talent cycle. So think about the talent cycle. The first thing is onboarding. You, I mean, is, is recruitment. You're trying to source for talent. You're trying to get the best talent in a country where you know people increasingly are leaving. At the same time, you, there's, there's very many job seekers. How do you get down to the ideal candidates? After that, you need to onboard them. You get them to buy into your vision. Um, after that, you know, there's a whole engagement. How do you retain them? How do you make sure that they're, they're, they're excited about being in your organization? There's a learning and development piece, you know, how are they growing while well, they're with you? And then finally, you know, if they have to leave, because, you know, especially for young people, they're probably going to change careers or they're going to change um, companies. They might jump up, you know, it's not something you can control. But how do you manage this as well? And more importantly, in this context, how do you think about this entire cycle with Japa in mind? So starting from recruitment, I think the first thing is you should identify your critical departments. Depending on the type of organization you're running, there's some things that will be critical. For example, you know, I run a B2B sales business, so I, I'm always looking for sales. The product, the devs, they're also super important. I think the one thing you have to realize here is that you need to always have a candidate pipeline. And it's easy to do this either with your recruitment partner or internally to say, um, hey, we always need to have a candidate map for this role. We need to understand who is on the market, how, how to reach them, maybe engage them, such that you need to interview on short notice, you have a pipeline to fall back to. You're not thinking, oh my goodness, where do I start? I think for your critical roles, there's really no room, especially because also with JAPA, you don't always know when somebody's going to leave. Somebody will show up at work today, but their passport is ready in the embassy, they're, will, they're waiting and they'll hand you notice, very, very short notice. In fact, I've even heard like, you know, some stories where they move to Canada or to Germany or to England, and they're working remotely for a bit before they finally come clean and say, oh, by the way, I left. I'm now handing in my notice. When things like that happen, the best thing, if the way to avoid that is if from the very beginning on a recruitment perspective, you always have a live candidate pipeline. Um, it sounds like it could be lots of work, not necessarily. I think the best way to do it is to create pools. So if you're looking for pools for particular roles, maybe for accountants or in finance or for HR or for tech, for developers, for software, for sales, big one, marketing, just always say, you know, you can scan LinkedIn, for example, and find a list of people. You can create projects on LinkedIn, you can do that on Jobberman as well, to just create people, uh, find pools of people who match the criteria you'd be looking for. Have conversations with them, you know, how's it going? I think some companies even go as far as interviewing. So you already know, almost you've had like a coffee chat or first round interview, and then you keep them aside. Maybe they're not available when you need them, but maybe they are. And either way, that engagement process has already put you ahead. The second thing is be very honest in the interview process, right? Have an honest conversation about long-term career plan and you can be direct. You know, where do you see yourself in the next five years? Where do you see this going? What's the role of my organization helping you get to where you're going? One of the questions I ask these days is, you know, are you planning to relocate? It's a very valid question, not from a good or bad place, but just so everybody's on the same page. And maybe you won't even get an honest answer from that, but there's something about body language, about the way they will come in, the way they'll answer that will give you insights into where they want to see where they see themselves long term and if it's within the country within the organization or if it's away or if literally on their way out you'll be able to gauge that um and you know at least you you say i asked up front and then finally if possible there's a concept of an error and a spare which is whenever you're hiring for a very important role you should definitely hire that person keep ideally that 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 pipeline still rolling in the background but if you can hire somebody a bit more junior to shadow them and begin to understand what they're doing and learn the ropes from them. The, the impact of this is if your heir, the main person, decides to drop her, then your spare who has been shadowing them can be and learning the ropes can step into that role. Even though they might need support and they might need some more coaching and nurturing, at least you will not be starting from scratch. That's another thing you can think about if it's open to you. And by air and despair, I don't think it means you know get two very very senior people. It could be you get somebody who is the thinker, the strategist, the leader of the department, or the most the person who's the core here, and the person shadowing them maybe does not have you know, 60% of the toolkit or the skills that this other main person has, but they're able to just like do the work. They're able to, to, to yeah, if directed, do the work to carry a bit of that load so that when something happens, they can step into their shoes and then grow into the role or you can support them. Or even if you need to hire somebody else, at least in the meantime, you're not left with your hands, you know, empty. 
after this becomes the orientation and onboarding. So I'm just trying to speak through, you know, how to think about Japa along the life cycle of talent, right? So in the onboarding, I think the most important thing, and I've experienced this several times. So I have lots of our clients, so people I've worked with um, in, in industry, stay engaged between the time when the offer is made and the talent is to resume because a lot is happening in a short time. I can't imagine the number of times where you've given an offer or we've given an offer or candidates have given an offer. And by the time it's, day one, you know, oh, my express entry came through, I'm not interested anymore. So I, a lot of a lot of times you have this habit of, you make the offer and you say, okay, starting date is 1st of March, then you go silent until 1st of March. In today's era, there is no guarantee that that person will show up on the 1st of March. So stay engaged, because this way, if you get wind, or if you talk to them and say, I've changed my mind, or I'm not coming anymore, my passport came back. And these are very, very valid conversations young people are having, by the way after getting offers for jobs, but you know, the plan A has come through. Maybe recruiting with you was the plan B. Now the plan A is here. They don't care anymore. They might not even let you know. So if you engage with them, you can know, and that will help you, I mean, not waste so much time to wait till day one of resumption and realize I have no staff, I have no candidate. I have to go back to the starting line. If you've been engaging them constantly, you can get ahead of that. Um, the second thing is, during orientation and onboarding, focus as much as possible on gaining buy-in for your company vision um, and the long-term vision. A lot of times, um, especially young people have not gotten the right career guidance or have never been exposed to that career guidance. They look at jobs as short-term things to fulfill their needs, not necessarily, you know, um, being part of a much bigger picture, tackling a larger problem or a larger opportunity in society, that's important. And you find this kind of short-term thinking is what drives them to say, where's the next big opportunity? Where's the next shiny thing? Maybe I need to leave. However, and also as companies, we don't always do a good job of of sharing why, like what's what's our why? Why are we here? If you stay with us, well, how are we impacting the world? And I think when you get people to buy in, into your vision, one, they're definitely gonna be a lot more motivated in the workplace. So that's definitely a pro. And they'll be um, a lot more in line with what you're trying to accomplish. But more importantly, if they really, really buy and adopt your vision, you could have them for a longer time because they'll feel that they need to accomplish something, hit a certain milestone, you know, leave a bit of a legacy in the grand picture of this vision before they leave. So that's something that could help you. Um, and then finally, lay out a clear path for growth, um, a clear path for growth and development. Again, lots of young people are leaving because they don't feel they have opportunities here. But if you can have conversations up front that say, today is day one, this is how you can grow in my organization. These are opportunities open to you. This is where you can be in six months, in 12 months, in five months. This is the way um, they might feel like, okay, this is somewhere I can grow. I thought I had opportunities, but there's an opportunity here in a place I'm trying to be upskilled or in a place that long term is important to my career. And once you paint that future for them and they buy into that future, you might get a bit more loyalty. And of course, none of this means that all of a sudden somebody who has their passport in the Canadian embassy is going to remove it, but you never know. It could be that they postpone. It could be that they end up with a longer notice period because they understand what's going on. It could be that they say, okay, you know, there's this particular milestone I want to hit or this particular legacy I want to leave. And they once once that, that's a, a clear picture to them, they commit in a way that previously they were just thinking, I'm here to do my time and I'm out. After onboarding, and I'll probably spend a lot of time here, the biggest piece that comes is engagement. And this is for retention, right? Because obviously, if you have people in the workforce, you need to keep them engaged. You need to um, kind of speak to their very ethos of being in the, uh, of working with you such that they're motivated to stay. Even if they're not japaring, somebody who is not engaged, who becomes checked out in a workplace, will still leave your organization. One of the ways you can do this is set up uh, better reward systems. So things like, and this is an old Salary, 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 but there could be like maybe profit sharing. There could be some sort of bonuses. There'd be um um yeah bonuses that help like you not know, to entice employees or like commissions. And I'll give an example. Um, recently a client was working on a long-term project, and they had a team that was at risk. And one of the things was to say, guys, this project is eighteen months. If you can commit to eighteen months and get it over the line, we are committing writing to giving you a. Uh, 40% bonus, you know, based off certain criteria. So already somebody who's working towards that automatically now has a goal. Because previously they could have been like, I want to leave, I want to leave, I want to leave. But now like, you know what? I'm going to leave. But there's this really, really good carrot waiting at the end of this project for me. 
I believe after it comes in. And that buys you time, right? Not it doesn't buy you forever all the time, but it buys you some time and you'll improve their job satisfaction. So there's and there's other things you can you, you can come up with beyond just like um financial incentives, right? The second thing is you know, create like a sense of belonging. Um lots of times people leave because they feel isolated in the workplace. You know, having open communication, having a meritocracy really where people feel that if they um if, if they're part of this bigger picture, they're growing and they're treated as equals, and then fostering connections between between leadership, the leadership team and the workforce, right? So that's not that disconnect. People know what's going on. People hear from their leaders. People understand that at this place we are all working together towards a common goal. And there's many ways to do this. It could be team building. It could be just town halls. It could be the way you communicate, like how you use tools like Slack or WhatsApp and how leaders show up in the organization. I think lots of times, even when young people want to leave, they can be swayed to remain a little longer because they are working with inspirational leadership. They still feel like there's something they can learn from their leaders. They feel like they're being heard. They feel like there's room for them to grow. They feel like their colleagues are you know, genuine and amiable. You know, it's not a toxic workplace. Um, when all these other issues come in and compound, then, you know, even if you're thinking about it, all of a sudden it accelerates the process, you know, my manager doesn't listen to me, I got a bad review, I can't explain why, I don't like my colleagues, I haven't spoken to anybody in a while, I have no idea what's happening in this organization. When all those things are there, if they're already thinking about leaving, it will accelerate their path. Whereas if they're engaged and they're feeling like, you know, I'm listened to, understand what my leaders are doing, understand why I'm here and why I'm part of this picture, it could again, retain them a bit longer or keep them satisfied a bit longer. And then the final thing here, obviously, is incorporate flexible work modes. So it's very interesting because, you know, less than a decade ago, less than five years ago, talking about flexible work modes is almost like a taboo in the workplace. You know, you wake up in the morning, you go to work by eight and you leave at five. That was a standard. But now employees that want to hold onto their staff have to embrace the future of work. And the future of work is flexible. And this could be many things. It could be, you know, Yes, maternity leave is three months, but if you're a new mom, you can continue to work remotely for the next three, you know, that's something that is really flexible. If you are in a particular demographic, and this all starts from understanding your employer value, employee value proposition, understanding the different types of demographic you have in your workplace and what kind of flexibility will work for them. Because guess what? What a bachelor needs is very different from what a young father needs or a young mother needs or somebody with older children needs um, or somebody who lives with their parents needs. Like trying to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, who are, what's, what, what's our staff body like? What drives them? And how can you make this work life situation a lot more flexible for them not based on this general thing that is like a blanket cover for all but actually specific things that speak to a particular individual it's going to be hard and again i mean i'm a young mother so i always use this, use this example but it's going to be very hard for me to think about leaving my job if you know coming back from maternity leave and being given you know flexible flexible working hours or you know work remotely or work from home or do whatever for the next seven hours for, for the next seven months or for the next six months until my child is a bit older or if maybe i would even travel to have the baby i've come back home those are the things that make a huge difference right also the things that can accelerate somebody leaving if it was already on their mind because like okay now what am i doing here this is not even working for my life for my personal life which i know is very very important so let me solve for myself because these people are not solving for me so i think the whole engagement piece just speaks to you know solve for the employer to for, for the employee too and let them let them feel that you know you're considering where they're coming from, what matters from them, and what flexibility means for them in that context. It's not not going to be the same for any, for everybody. Um, then there's learn, learning and development. This is a really big one, and I think this is a, 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 um, a tool that's really underutilized. You can deepen your talent bench by building, not buying. I think a lot of the times, and this also kind of linking back a bit to the air and the spare concept, right? A lot of the times we want to hire people who are already skilled, who know what they're doing, who can ramp up on day one and they're superstars. But guess what? They're not always existing in the industry, they're not sitting around, so you're going to be poaching. Poaching is great, but poaching is also terrible because it means you're not necessarily increasing the talent bench of the industry all around. It's pretty much you're moving from one place to another, getting from one person to another, and these guys will still leave. The same way you poach them, they could be poached from you, but also you could have exit plans. And that's buying talent, right? When you take the, uh, the deliberate decision to build your talent bench, it takes longer, but it pays off because now it means you're getting younger people, less experienced, you're creating exact like career paths for them, learning and development paths for them, thinking, you know, I know that I, I'm looking to have, I have a CFO. I want to know that, you know, everybody in the finance team potentially can be a CFO. I can either go and buy in the market somebody who's already like at a deputy CFO level 
Or I can get someone who is a recently qualified chartered accountant with four years of experience, is eager to learn, wants the opportunity, and I'll invest in them knowing full well that it's going to pay off. And in the meantime, I have their skill set. The truth is, this person might also leave. And so, and I think that's where the, the push and pull comes in, right? How do you balance between investing in talent, knowing they might still leave, or spiting, you know, sp cutting off your nose to spite your face in the meantime because you're not investing in building or in training them? I mean, at the end of the day, if we want good people in organizations, we kind of have to create and invest in, in, in their skill set and get them to a place we want them to be. And don't be put off when they leave, you know, at least, you know, they'll have contributed while they're there in the best way possible because they're like given the tools. And more importantly, when they go, they're better off. And I think as organizations, we have to start thinking about our role and our responsibility in growing talent um, overall in the country, right? And it starts with L&D. If you build not buy, you'll have a much deeper bench. In fact, you'll have not even an air and a spare, you'll have an air and five spares, right? Because you've got this input. And I think this thing thinking is what may what has made um graduate recruitment programs so popular in um the larger corporates because obviously it's a, it's a clear path to developing a deep management bench or a deep talent bench for an SME it can be a bit tougher so of course you're going to hire 10 people but it could be one or two somebody young willing able eager to learn probably also doesn't even have the savings yet necessary to jump up, but you know, they're going to grow view. And maybe when they get those savings, they will still go, but you'll have had enough time with them to also reap those benefits. Um, the other thing is, you know, Taylor Ellen Dinner, Win. Sometimes employees feel like leave because they feel like they're not getting enough value. I'm trying to study. I'm trying to do this. You're not offering me that opportunity. I see your learning and development goal or initiatives, but they're not connected with what I want to do. So I think there's room to have a new conversation around LND where you actually say, okay, what are your plans? You know, are you trying to do ACCA? Are you trying to do a master's degree? How can you support you to do that? For example, if your goal is to study, you're trying to go to Canada, it could be to say, you know what? If you give us a year, we'll pay for your application, your visa application and university application, and we'll support you on that journey. Or if you're doing an MBA, do you want to start doing it remotely? We'll give you the hours and when it's time for you to ease out, at least we know you've been working on it. And I actually had an employee who did that, you know, she was doing an MBA in Canada, started off remotely, we worked together, she was working, you know, in Jobberman, we knew she was going to leave at one point, eventually when it's time for her to leave, she's still like, you know, eased out um, gently, but it's because we supported her goal and we knew her goal in involved leaving. We also knew we still needed her for a while and we had to kind of make it work. Um, so maybe just having this L&D, study leave, education allowance, whatever it is in line with their JAPA goals, not necessarily yours, hopefully they're related because you know they're trying to remain in the same career space, but either way, as long as they're adding value to you, be open to that, like, you know, shaping L&D in terms of what they're looking for, as well as what you're looking for. And the fifth, which is um, offboarding, right? You know, it starts a so solid succession planning system. All this talent bench building, that speaks to succession planning. But so does, you know, thinking about when do I have to start looking externally to make sure that I'm refurbishing, you know, my bench and it's always solid. Like the spare, the spare we've been speaking about all this time should always be ready to step into the shoes of the person they're shadowing. This speaks to a lot of investment. It speaks to coaching. It speaks to exposure to management, to understanding systems, you know, that should tomorrow we wake up and we have a one month's notice, there's a plan for somebody to come in. Or there's a plan on how we're going to ramp up this person, the plan on how we're going to fill up this gap. The second thing here I would say is be open to negotiations. So the thing is what people don't realize, especially today, and depending on your industry, not always possible, but depending on your industry, for a committed team member, change of location does not always have to mean change of work, at least not immediately. And I think if you can get over the anger, sometimes you know we we, try, we, we get angry before leaving, you end up just having a bad relationship. I'll just speak into point three as well. Um, yet you don't have to, right? You say, hey, you're leaving, we still need you. What's your plan? Do you have a job? And I've had these conversations with, my, with people on my team as well. Do you have a job in Germany or in Canada already? What's your plan? Do you want to keep on working for us remotely? We really love what you're doing. We can be flexible when the hours will be tough, at least for the next four months. Give us four months, even after you've relocated. It, and it's a win-win. It gives them time to settle in as well. It gives them an income while they're trying to figure out their new country. It gives them a soft landing. Um, of course, eventually, they're going to find a job in their new location. They'll leave you. But in the meantime, they've gotten enough you know, from even from a new location to either hand over in a very, very good way to the new person or to ramp them up, to coach them, to build a certain system or process that's going to um, help or just to actually keep on doing the work until the person you've hired comes in. Because sometimes even when you hire, there's a notice period, there's everything going on. So if you have that, if you're able to negotiate and say, 
I don't want to lose you just yet. How do you make it work? You'll be surprised at how many people who are Japaying will come to the table and say, thank you, because even I need a soft landing. I want a salary before I figure out, figure out a job. I still need to pay rent. I still need just something. And the more flexible you can be about that, the better for both of you. Um, and then maintain the relationship. Don't make an enemy out of people you don't need to make an enemy with. Very many employers take it personal when people leave, especially young people. And like, it's really not about you. We have to realize that even though young people are committed to organizations and to our companies, at the end of the day, the, the career path is a personal one. It's a personal one. And especially with Japa, it's even beyond personal because you're thinking it's not necessarily about money. Okay, it is a it could be a bit, but it's about the overall well-being of a person. It could be about healthcare, it could be about education, it could be about security, it could be about so many things. But as soon as you take it personal that somebody is leaving you as opposed to making a better decision for themselves, then you get into this space where you end up ruining a good relationships to it, uh, towards the end, and then you're locked off from enjoying those resources, as opposed to a world where you actually say, You've been, you've done a good job here. You know, we loved working with you. We want to keep this relationship. And then every single time it's an issue, you can just like send a message and say, "Hey, remember last year when you were working at ABC? I'm trying to find X, and they'll be very happy to jump up and support you." Or maybe they've already left, but you couldn't find a replacement. And find a replacement, you can call. And I've done this before to call somebody back and say, "I know you're now remote, but can you just give us two weeks to onboard your successor? We finally hired somebody, and we genuinely believe that you're the best person to round them up. Do you have capacity to do that? And happy to pay like a small either consulting fee, or even sometimes they'll just do it out of the goodness of their heart because they really want to hand over. But that stems down to the kind of relationships that you're trying to build." Um, and how you how you end that relationship. So don't make enemies unless you have to. If somebody has, is not trying to leave badly, don't make them leave badly. And also to be fair, this relationship thing also starts from the engagement, how you've been managing them, the entire work relationship. If by the time somebody's leaving, they also feel like they're leaving a toxic place, of course they want to, they won't want to hear from you. But if by the time they're leaving, they feel like they're leaving a place that's nurtured them, that's grown them, they'll even feel that loyalty to know, I don't want to leave these people in the lurch. I don't want to leave them hanging. I want to be able to... Um, leave with a good name as well. And then you can get to, to a good understanding. Um, and I'll stop here from now. for now. Thank you. I know we only have 30 minutes and I wanted to leave enough time for questions. So I'm open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilda. Interesting topic, interesting presentation, interesting session. And it appears to me that while the Jackpot Wheel is still very much around, it does not spell doom and gloom for finding and retaining skilled labor in this era. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Hilda, in the course of your presentation, you've you know, uncovered a lot of insights, things that we should pay attention to, especially in terms of recruitment, in terms of um, onboarding and orientation, in terms of engagement, particularly for retention. And I got something from there, that the future of work is flexible. You also talked about learning and development and tailoring L&D initiatives to the needs of the employees. And then one key thing that stood out for me was offboarding and the fact that it's important to maintain a relationship, the relationship that leaving any particular organization does not translate into, you know, some form of um, negative reactions that should come with that. Thank you very much, Hilda. As I mentioned earlier, the topic was very interesting. And in fact, we had questions sent in ahead of your presentation. I will take those questions. And then I'm also keeping an eye on the chat room for those of our participants who have um, certain things they would like you to maybe touch on again and probably provide further clarification. Okay, um, one of the first, one of the first um, questions that we, we got, and this one is um, a bit interesting. There was a tech founder who, you know, once boasted about interviewing hundreds of candidates just to find a few. And maybe to help um, small businesses stay efficient in terms of um, recruitment, would you say that there are, you know, what are those efficient ways of finding talent who are capable of adding value from day one, such that you don't have to run through numerous candidates just before you find that perfect fit? Mm. 
No, I, I I hear you. I think you know every, nobody wants to kiss very many frogs before they find their prince, so to say, right? But yes, especially in Nigeria, you're going to interview a lot of candidates, and for several reasons. One, there are very many qualified people. They might not be the right fit for your organization. It doesn't necessarily make them unqualified. At the same time, there's also very many unqualified people who are unemployed because unemployment rate is high. So if anybody sees a good job, they're going to try and, and, and get a shot for it. I think what you can do to get to the, you know, your ideal person as soon as possible is to make recruitment as objective as possible. And it's not going to talk about the funnel. So first of all, how many people are hearing about your vacancy? As many people as possible need to be to know because the only way you're going to get the right person to the right job is if you can try to ensure in a way democratic access is opportunity right so whether it's the recruitment partner whether it's the job board whatever it is you know make sure you have a very wide funnel think about it like sales very wide funnel at the top but then now use data to narrow it down so don't make it a subjective experience where somebody has sit and hire 100 uh, interview 100 uh, 100 people no that's not efficient for example you could start with a, um a, a competency-based test, you know, that could be a place you start. Already, you have your cutoff score, it's going to eliminate from the 100, it's going to bring it down to 30. After that, you can have a skills-based test, and that's actually something we do on our platform, but you know where you can say, I'm looking for a sales manager, this is something, as a sales manager of five years of experience, I should expect you to understand this case study on the end to end, on the, on the, on the, on the sales cycle, you know. Do you have that knowledge or not? How do you score against that? That'll bring the 30 down to maybe, you know, seven or 10, depending on what you want to do. Now the 10, you can have concrete interviews with because you realize, yes, they were qualified from that top of the funnel based off your, based off um, the, the, the job description and the data points you're putting there. They've passed, you know, the competency, just the, the general things around behavior and things like that. You know their skill, they're 10. Now these 10, you can actually take time to interview because remember, you want the candidate pipeline, right? So if you have 10, Honestly, 10 good people, you're at a good pool. Of course, you're gonna to get to your top one, but you also know that should that top one japa, you now have nine people who you've already had significant interaction with to a point where you know they could be close to your organization that you can go back and re-engage. And even if none of them is the right person for you, it kind of helps narrow it down. So I think if you want to get to a person who can add value on day one, the biggest trick is remove as much subjectivity as possible from the hiring process and introduce data as well. Let data drive the decision making until you get to a number that's manageable, that you can engage and spend time with and actually interview in depth and understand if they're a good fit for your organization or not. Technology helps with this. I'll add that. <laughs> oh, yes, I, I agree. Thank you very much, um, Hilda, for that answer. Um, um, we have a question from Monday, James Ava. Good morning, Monday. So um, James would like to know, is it wise to increase an employee's pay when they are leaving because of the pay? or just let them go because they'll still leave in the future anyway. So I think this borders on remuneration. Yes, it, that's a very slippery slope, but my, it's a very slippery slope for very many reasons, right? And I'll start with the negatives because they're easier to understand from an employer from an employer perspective. Then I'll talk about the other side of it. So obviously, you you're working with a budget. You're working with a budget, and we all know there's no budget as a standard, right? You know, generally, you set your budget for the year, the salaries. If pay is an issue, you know that if you increase one person's pay, there could be several other people coming behind to say, ah, so and so got a pay review, where is my own? And that's a problem. You don't want to to interact. You don't want to create in your organization. At the same time, you don't want this, if they they might leave anyway, whether they increase it or not. Because sometimes people, you know, fight for the pay increase just to get a higher base to negotiate their next salary. I've seen it happen several times. At the same time, however, if this is somebody you truly value, you should find that budget because guess what? It's going to be much, much cheaper for you to actually increase this person's pay than to go back into the market and hire somebody at that level. Because when people are growing in the organization, the increments are not that tremendous. But when it's a crossover, migrating across organizations, it's always a huge leap. So you could say, I don't want to give somebody a 20% increase. They leave. Then all the candidates are interviewing, it turns out, are coming in at at least 60% higher. Then really, in, as young people say, you've played yourself. So I think you also have to assess how critical is this person to my organization, because even if they're going to leave later on, the most important thing is that you don't want them to leave right now. What I typically do is when I have those conversations with people now, that's why you got the recruitment in the cycle, start building that pipeline. 
Once you have that increased conversation, start building that pipeline, not because you're expecting the worst, but because as a prudent business manager, you need to plan for it. If they've asked for one pay increase, they could it could be because they're negotiating somewhere else. It could be because genuinely they want to be able to commit to you and give you their best, but this is an issue for them and you'll solve it and they'll be the best employee ever, right? Or it could be because... Um, they're, they're on their way out and they're trying to rack up savings so they can go. Either way, your priority is I don't want me to be left in the lurch today. So if that if that pay increase is going to buy you three months instead of the one month notice you're, you're going to get tomorrow, I think it's worth it. It's a trade-off. You have to decide if it's worth it, depending on the person. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Hilda. Monday, I believe um, she's done justice to your question and i totally agree with you Hilda, because there's this saying that it is um more expensive to onboard new staff as opposed to you know elevating and promoting existing exactly. ones and i'm sure that that is something that all of us we pay attention to going forward in our respective um, small businesses i have another um question from victor so victor would like to know your own you know, advice based on professional experience, how long would you advise that an employee stay or endure a toxic working environment in an economy like ours where good jobs seem to be few and far between? So how would you, I think um, Victor is trying to know the best you know, way yeah. to navigate certain um, working environments that may not be all that healthy. What would your recommendations yeah. be here then? So it's a tough one, right? It's a tough one. And I will say maybe two things about this. First of all, ideally nobody should ever have to endure that. But I understand, right? Bills need to be paid. There needs to be food on the table. It's not always an option. What I typically advise in this situation is know your why, right? Know your why. I'm here because I need to accomplish A, B, C. That's the first thing. So you know what you're fighting towards. It could be, for example, I have a bonus at the end of the year. I'm here because I need that bonus to complete my house or I need it to do something else, right? If that's your why, then focus on that why. That's the first thing. Second thing would be, in as much as possible, even though the environment is toxic, try not to let yourself devolve into that toxicity. Focus on your why. I'm coming to work because this is waiting for me at the end of it. I'm seeing every all the confusion happening there and it's painful. So I have to build that mental resilience. You know, it's there, but I'm powering through because of my why. The third thing is have a plan, right? The best thing you can do, and I always there's this concept in that's popular in technology. I'm not sure if any of you know it around OKRs, objective and key results, right? You can have personal objectives and key results. I'm in this toxic environment. My objective, I need it. I need this salary. I also need my bonus end of the year, but my objective for the next 12 months is to get myself out of this. What are the key results? By the end of Q1, I need to have submitted at least 20 applications. By the end of Q2, key result, I need to have done interviews, or maybe I need to have started a side hustle, entrepreneurship, something. Keep tracking those key results, knowing that if you accomplish them across the year, come December, come whenever your, your, your cutoff point is, you're able to leave. I think even if it's a toxic environment, if you know I've got an exit plan, I am working on my exit plan, and I'm progressing on the exit plan, it makes it easier to manage. But again, the baseline here is in the perfect world, nobody should have to stay in a toxic environment longer than a day. Thank you very much, Hilda. Um, Victor, I believe she's also done justice to your question. The key thing is find your why and have an exit plan. That, Victor's question, interestingly, is you know kind of interested to one of the questions that we had received be, beforehand. And the question is about, you know, when we talk about high unemployment rates, you know, as a business, and then businesses still struggle to find quality talent. So there seems to be a gap in, 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 in that market. So what, what would you say, what would you share? What are your thoughts around, you know, the availability of quality talents in Nigeria and how small businesses may be successful in, you know, acquiring such talents? So this is actually what we spoke about around building versus buying, building a talent bench, right? Nobody is trying to build benches, or maybe not nobody. Very few people are trying to build talent benches. Everybody wants to see what other organizations already built and poach and poach and poach. But the impact on that in the entire labor market, it means we're not deepening 
the skill sets. We're not deepening the quality of labor. You find somebody with seven years of experience who is great, but rather than, you know, somebody say, okay, I'm gonna hire somebody with two years of experience and grow them and to the place where they're seven. So we've got more, you know, think about a world where everybody's trying to hire the same one or to poach the same 1,000 accountants in Lagos. And this is very hypothetical. You're all trying to poach the same 1,000 accountants in Lagos, right? Of course, then you're not deepening the talent bench. There'll be a lot of unexperienced, unqualified accountants who are not getting a chance to grow and be nurtured because everyone is poaching at this level. The, and, and of course, there's the issue around, you know, the quality of education, the high unemployment rates, all those things are part of why you cannot always find qualified labor. But if we could move from, a, from the mindset of what am I, let me buy, let me buy already made and move to, and everybody said, let me build. You know, imagine a world where, you know, with 1 million SMEs, every SME each year is getting on a freshly qualified accountant and investing in teaching them systems, right? All of a sudden we'd have a million freshly, I mean, a million more qualified accountants by the end of the year. That deepens the talent bench. So the thing around like, Buying, coaching versus building is a huge contributor to that. But of course, the systemic issues around just a number of young people who don't have jobs. I think we did research uh, last year, you know, around how young people survive without jobs. And one of the key insights there was that on average in West Africa, you know, Ghana, Nigeria, it's taking fresh graduates five years to find employment, five years to find their first role. By that time, you've forgotten your skills that even learned in university, right? So when somebody like that hits the job market, of course, they'll come up as unqualified. Then as an employer, you're confused. This person has a first class degree from a great university, but they don't know anything. The opportunities have not been created. But what you should do is approach this with empathy. When you meet such a person and they're brilliant and they're committed and they're willing, teach them. you be the first person to get them from unqualified to experienced because you know something they don't and all they're looking for is that opportunity and those opportunities are far and few between. Uh, I can't hear you, Shay. I'm not sure what's going on. Your sound has disappeared. No. It could be just me, but I can't. You're on mute. I think you accidentally muted yourself, maybe. No, unfortunately. Oh yeah, I think there's a, there's a question in the chat just speaking to off-boarding okay. versus on-boarding, right? Oh, okay. oh you're back, you're back. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now? I can hear you. I was just going to answer the question I saw in the chat. Oh, okay. Please, uh, please go ahead. Off -boarding, Thank you. boarding So I think just going through back to I, when I describe the life cycle of a of the talent, right? Onboarding is when people just join the organization. How do you ramp them up? You know, it's day one. Sometimes some organizations day one and they just put you on your desk and give you a computer and you figure things out, right? But it can be deliberate. I think like in our, in my organization, for example, the onboarding period is a month and you expect it to work a little bit, but maybe not that much. It's more focused on how do you, how do we help you smooth, ease into a trans, in, into organization very, very smoothly? You know, what tools do we use? What's our vision? Who is our CEO? What are they doing? You know, what, what, how do people grow? What are examples of career moves that have happened in the organization? How can you be successful here? How do you do performance management? All those things that will make somebody feel prepared to contribute to your organization as soon as possible. If you've got great onboarding, then of course, like from day one or from day 10, from day 20, they're ready to go. But when you just leave people to fly, to like hang around, figuring things out by themselves, it could take them three months. I think that's probably how the, the, the concept of the first 100 days came in, right? You need 100 days to figure out an organization. But if you've got so solid onboarding, maybe you can cut down those 100 to 30, you know, and that's what onboarding is. Offboarding is now the reverse. Once you onboard them, of course, you have to retain them. There's performance management, there's everything that happens while they're there. Offboarding is at the point where an employee says, boss, I want to leave. 
everything that happens between then and their final day of work is an offboarding process. You know, the relationships building, everything you owe them, whether it's their pensions, whatever, everything you need to settle between each other. Um, the handover, that's a very important one. How do you ramp up a new person? All the documents we've been working on, all their client relationships, all of that is offboarding and it ends when you say bye bye, you know, thank you for everything. And there's an email, maybe, and it's a wrap. So that's the difference in on and offboarding. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you very much, Hilda. And so it's interesting how this session is going because someone in the chat has asked a question that is a bit similar to one of the questions we got before, before the, the session. So I'll just um, quickly go to to that i think this is for for victory so victory would like to know you know when it comes to leadership how does one effectively lead his or her company or her team from this perspective of you know talent retention and someone has also asked earlier that what advice would you have for a small business that is trying to develop a performance culture so if you could help take those two um, somehow related questions together in your answer. Yeah. I'd say um, huh, maybe in a number of things, and maybe it's big, the performance piece might be easier, but let me start the leadership piece, right? I think the first thing you have to realize is that, especially with millennials and Gen Z and the younger generation, right? We want to see vulnerable leaders. You know, everybody knows that nobody's infallible. We want to understand that you're human as well and that you see our humanity. I think the more you can show up to your team, as your authentic self, incorporating your whole self to the organization, the better. You know, I think previous generations more like, you know, this very, very boxy approach leadership. You're the boss, you're the boss, you're the boss. But no, that's just not true unless you're lying, right? Everybody has a life. So bring that for life to the organization and let people see pieces of it to connect. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Across Africa, a new era has begun. Shifting our focus to a new horizon, connecting us with one purpose, to create and share opportunities to grow. brighter tomorrow, built by our dreams and our energy. Across our continent, across the world, we are creating a better way to a better future. A pan-African future, together. Echo Bank, a better way, a better Africa.